Tim Bird, please start your presentation and we'd like to start sharing the last name. Let's see here. Can you see the screen? Yes, it is. Yes, yes, yes we can. OK, great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, very pleased to uh, be here for the Jamboree. Uh, I always enjoy an opportunity to uh, talk to fellow Linux developers. Um, this is a, a talk that I give uh, quite often. Uh, it's the Embedded Linux Community Update, or the status of Embedded Linux talk. This has been updated for May of 2019. Uh, as Witasan said, I'm a uh, senior staff software engineer at Sony Electronics, and I'm also a member of the Linux Foundation Technical Advisory Board. And uh, just by way of introduction, uh, a lot of a lot of you, if you are regular attendees of the Jamboree, you've probably uh, seen this talk before. Uh, but just to, for those who haven't, uh, it's just a quick overview of lots of different embedded topics. Um, it's really intended to be a springboard for further research. Uh, so I don't go into uh, really in-depth any of the topics, but I just kind of introduce different topics. So if you happen to be interested in, say, power management or uh, networking, uh, you might see something that you want to go further do research on. And I have uh, uh, links throughout the document to articles uh, that I've seen that I think are interesting. And I have to warn, this is not comprehensive. This is just something I, I put together based on material that I see. I do, uh, uh, in, in my role at Sony and in the Linux Foundation, I kind of hear about lots of different things going on. And, uh, and uh, so this is just stuff that I saw. Uh, this is the overall outline for this talk. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, different open source software areas. This is structured a little bit differently than I've been in the past. Uh, I made a kind of a switch over the last time I gave a talk, which was in March. But anyway, this is the, the major uh, section. So let's start with OSS areas. So I'm mostly going to go over uh, operating systems, at mostly Linux, uh, but there are other open source operating systems that are kind of interesting. Uh, and then I'll go over a few key uh, technology areas, uh, and we'll get to those in a little bit. So in terms of operating systems, I'm going to talk about these. And uh, arguably, Android is on top of Linux, but it's kind of its own distribution. And so, so NetX, uh, and some of these slides are a direct duplicate of what I gave in March. But um, so if I go over something fairly quickly, it's probably a sign that, uh, that there's not been a lot of new information on that. Um, and this is one of those slides. So NetX is working on their first ever conference. It's, uh, it's actually scheduled for July 16th and 17th in the Netherlands. And it's sponsored by Technolution, a technology company over in the Netherlands. Uh, but both Sony and XP are involved and are uh, providing hardware and support for the event. And we're expected to see about 70 attendees of that at that event. So that'll be really exciting to get some information on that. Um, and uh, this is the first, again, first ever conference for NetX. Uh, NetX is used in a couple of different products of Sony, um, and uh, some really interesting ones as well that people can experiment with. Uh, there's also a NetX YouTube channel. If you're using NetX, uh, you should go to this channel, and uh, one of the main developers of NetX has lots of introductions and tutorials, descriptions of features uh, that are available. In terms of Zephyr, there's not a whole lot of uh, news. Um, uh, this is also kind of a repeat slide from last time. Uh, in March of last year, so this is pretty old news, uh, Zephyr gained memory protection, uh, which is, it's, it's a, Zephyr is a much lower end operating system than Linux, and so uh, it originally it did not have uh, memory protection, but it does now. The other thing I found out talking to people is that there's also support for POSIX APIs. Now, I do not know how complete this support is. Um, I, I tried to find some stuff. I didn't, I didn't actually go through the source code looking at stuff. I just went to the online docs. And there is a config option to enable POSIX APIs. The docs are a little sketchy, though. It just says, enables mostly standards compliant implementations of various POSIX APIs, uh, the IEEE 1003. So 
Um, the 1003 in that specification actually refers to the number of POSIX APIs there are, which is over a thousand. So I don't know how many APIs are supported, or uh, it's a little bit worrisome that it says mostly standards compliant implementation, uh, but it could be it could be good. So one thing that has kind of set NutX apart from the other uh, RTOSs out there has been its POSIX support. Uh, so maybe Zephyr is at, at seeing that and adding some positive support as well. In terms of Android, um, so Google just had Google I.O. Uh, in the United States a couple weeks ago. Uh, and uh, they announced a whole lot of things. But in terms of Android, they had the third beta for Android uh, 10, which is their Q version. We don't know. They're trying to, there's a very limited number of uh, desserts that are based on the letter Q. So we'll have to see uh, what they come up with for a name. Uh, but uh, basically, they're on their third beta. We'll probably see a final release of that in August. Some of the features that are kind of interesting are uh, dark mode, uh, which is uh, kind of just a different color scheme uh, for applications. Uh, and then uh, a, a lot of uh, changes to, the, uh, to some of the system interactions between applications to allow kind of more multitasking. So you'll, there's a floating settings panel. So you don't have to go all the way to the system settings to adjust some of the settings. Uh, they'll pop up inside your application. A new thing, which is dynamic depth format for photos. So um, some cameras are able to capture depth information as part of uh, as part of the photo. And Google is actually pushing a new photo file format uh, that includes this depth information. Uh, they're trying to get that kind of standardized as a convention throughout the industry, which I think is uh, is really interesting. What this allows you to do is um, when, when you take the photo, if you include the depth information, you can do interesting, very, very interesting process processing. So you could use, uh, you could later reconstruct 3D scenes from a single image, uh, or you could also uh, do things like adjust the focus uh, after the picture was taken. So uh, you have enough information that you can, you know, pick one of the planes in the depth information and make that out of focus to, to make it look like a professional photography photo. So that's pretty interesting. There's some new codecs, AV1, HRD10+, plus, and Opus. Opus is an audio codec. Uh, AV1 is a video codec. codec. Um, also support for foldable phones. I don't know if they're uh, starting to show up in Japan, but in the US there's been announcements of some foldable phones. and. Uh, Finally, uh, this, there's actually many more features, but these are some of the major ones. Uh, there's a new multitasking feature called Bubbles, which allows you to see an application. Uh, you can minimize it, and it's kind of floating on the screen. And you can either dismiss it, or, or if you want to do, you can do some quick operations. For instance, if you are having a chat conversation, you could be having a main window where you're doing some stuff, and then a chat could pop up in a bubble. You could you could either dismiss it or, or respond to it. And so it's a different uh, way to do multitasking that's kind of more useful in uh, a mobile phone uh, setting. Um, OK, so those are some of the different uh, operating systems out there uh, besides the kernel. So Android is on the kernel, but it's kind of its own uh, operating system. In terms of, so let's get into some of the technical information about the Linux kernel. So here's the kernel versions we've had in the last year. Uh, starting, uh, actually there was one more, we haven't hit June yet, 4.17 I think was in June. Uh, but in any event, uh, 4.18 through 5.2, we're actually on 5.2 RC1, release candidate 1. We've had the merge window. Uh, if you look at this, uh, something that stands out was last fall we had the, the a, a release that was managed by Greg Carl Hartman, and so it was in, uh, that was the kind of a little bit, Linus took a step back for a little while and let him take over. That was actually um, a good exercise to see if the processes would work, and they did. Um, we have already had the merge window for 5.2, so we have a pretty good idea what it, what's going to be in it, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. We expect that pretty much uh, in about 60 to 70 days, uh, and uh, we'll see what happens uh, with the timing on that, but it's not that not that critical. I think that puts us somewhere in July, I believe, uh, maybe late June. Um, 
In terms of looks Ford I-18, some of these older ones I'm going to go over kind of quickly because we, we I presented them before. Uh, and I don't highlight all of the features in the kernels, but just some of the things that I think are potentially interesting for um, embedded development. Uh, so one of those is power management. So in 4.18, uh, there was a new um, thing called active state management that was added uh, for power domains. And so um, what it does is allows you to, instead of just providing enable and disable for a power domain, uh, or for different idle states, you can. You, there's kind of continuum of, opera, continuum of operation. You can, you can kind of turn the knob to to uh, control the power states more in a more complicated fashion. Um, and there's an LWN.net article you can read on that. Um, uh, also, the BP filter user mode helper system, and I think I have another slide that talks about this. Yeah. So this is uh, this is a really I, I'm going to talk more about BPF, uh, which is Berkeley Packet Filter, uh, but this is a feature that was introduced uh, last year, uh, late last year in 4.18, uh, which is a user mode helper. So what they're trying to do is the whole reason BPF got added to the kernel was to support essentially user configurable uh, program to ha manage packet routing. And packet routing is a, a very complicated um, process. And for years, uh, we've had like several different uh, systems, including the most recent one that's popular now, which is called NetFilter, uh, where you use a declarative syntax to define the routing uh, information that the, the kernel is going to use for the network layer. Um, well. Having a declarative syntax is, is all well and good, but eventually people want to do things that are even more complicated and do computations. And so uh, they added Berkeley Packet Filter, which is a way to actually inject new code into the kernel. Uh, what they found, though, is that it was very, very hard for the kernel to actually switch over from NetFilter to BPF uh, because the NetFilter code is just so complicated. And so what they came up with instead, they didn't want to put all that complexity inside the kernel. So they made a program in user space. And so now their mechanism work, works like this. So uh, there's a program uh, that will take the net filter configuration protocol, compile it into uh, BPF code, and that will be compiled in user space. And it'll actually retrieve some code out of the Linux source tree. It'll turn that into a kernel lo loadable module and actually load that and execute it and the really interesting thing is that's all initiated from the kernel. So this is not the user space telling the kernel to do something. This is the kernel telling user space to do something, uh, which involves loading a new kernel module. So it's very complicated, but it's very interesting. Uh, as a mechanism, this may lead to all kinds of really interesting, uh, crazy stuff where the kernel can request user space assistance to, to compile new features and, um, and that kind of thing. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with this over time. Uh, in 4.19, uh, some of the big things were um, the L1TF mitigation. This is a variant of Meltdown, uh, which is speculative execution uh, uh, vulnerabilities, security vulnerabilities in the kernel. Uh, there's more security vulnerabilities. I kind of stopped keeping track. There's so many of them that are based on speculative execution. Uh, it seems like every kernel version has a couple of new mitigations or some new features related to mitigations. Uh, so this is, this is the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, we also have time-based packet transmission, uh, which allows a program to schedule data for transmission in the future. So you can do some fairly advanced uh, real-time uh, real networking uh, with this feature. Uh, and then something called the Enhanced Read-Only File System, or AeroFS. I don't know if that's the, how they pronounce it. But uh, this is, uh, it, in certain embedded situations, it's really useful to have a read-only file. It's useful to have a read-only file system uh, to keep some of your data safe for, uh, for security reasons and also for performance. So uh, this read-only file system uh, has some additional features for high performance. It's currently in staging, but it's actually present, so you could start using it if you wanted to. Um, some other things in 4.19, the uh, block I.O. latency controller. Uh, so normally the block I.O. controller uh, tries to optimize bandwidth, 
Um, and uh, in this case, there's some new code that allows you to optimize for latency. So people getting into real-time uh, real operations, well, bounded operations. I don't know if uh, you'd actually qualify as real-time, but uh, uh, you, can, you can schedule some of your block uh, input-output uh, based on the latency, which is usually needed for real-time operations. And then there's a new packet queuing discipline called CAKE, or common, common Applications Kept Enhanced. I'm not, that seems like a, a, a made-up acronym to me. Uh, but um, this is really targeted. So there's been a long-standing problem in the networking world called buffer bloat, uh, which is uh, uh, the way the network traffic flows through the system and through you know, the, the wider network in the world. Uh, there, uh, there's very common for uh, buffers to accumulate packets and then the traffic ends up being bursty um, um, because of the way the queuing happens. Well, this has been a kind of solved issue at the, at the kind of the big routers know how to deal with the traffic shape and packet timing in order to, to deal with this issue. But that's not been true for consumer level routers. Uh, so if you're running a Linux system and you're behind a consumer level router on uh, relatively slow broadband link, uh, say at your home, or if you have a small business with, uh, with kind of low level networking, uh, you're going to be affected by a lot of this stuff. So they have a new packet queuing discipline that uh, does traffic shaping uh, that solves, solves that problem. So that's actually uh, pretty nice. Uh, so continuing to, to work on enhancing uh, the networking services of the kernel. And then the uh, final thing in 4.19 is new asynchronous polling interface. So another API for, for doing asynchronous polling. Uh, this has to do with file system performance and in particular, again, a little bit having to do with um, responsiveness uh, when uh, you're doing uh, any kind of I.O., but in particular file system I.O. Um, let's see, the 4.20, we have the introduction of something called the X-Ray Data Structure. And actually, this is just a reworking of the Radix tree uh, with some better APIs. Um, it actually is pretty much doing the same thing the Radix tree did. Um, but uh, what they noticed was that the Radix tree had a lot of features that people weren't using. And it had a very difficult to use API. And so and so the other drivers within the kernel and subsystems weren't using it very effectively. And so they actually split the API into two parts, a normal API and an advanced API. And, uh, and they simplified some sections of the code. And uh, instead of uh, treating it like a tree, they now treat it as an array, or at least conceptually, even though the code under underneath is the same, uh, it actually, the mental model for developers is, is much simpler if you think of the data structure as an array. Anyway, the page cache has already been converted to use it, and other subsystems will start to use it as well. Um, another thing in 420 was that PCI subsystem uh, added support for peer-to-peer -peer DMA operations uh, between peripherals. So if you have PCI on your system, that may be of interest to you for uh, higher performance transfers uh, between devices. Um, and then in this release, a whole bunch of, so there's been a, something called the uh, multi-queue API uh, for supporting multiple uh, input-output queues um, for uh, I.O. scheduling. And uh, so the, the actual I.O. scheduler, multi-queue I.O. scheduler has been there for quite a long time. This, had, this, is, uh, this was invented primarily to deal with very high speed solid state drives. Um, but it had, it had existed, but you needed to convert the actual block drivers over to using it. And so in this release of the kernel 4.2, a whole bunch of block drivers were converted over uh, to the multi-queue API. So this affects your disk performance, or I should say your storage performance, maybe not be, via disk. Uh, this becomes really important as we see uh, more and more use of solid state storage in devices. Uh, in Linux 5.0, we saw uh, some stuff having to do with energy-aware scheduling. We saw some 64-bit versions of syscalls uh, for time fields, and this is for a year 2038 problem. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later. 
Uh, and actually, the legacy block IO la block layer IO scheduler. Uh, so after they converted all those drivers in the 4.19 release uh, to use the multi queue layer, uh, they remove actually removed the I guess the single queue layer IO scheduler. Uh, so it's actually now gone. Uh, and then uh, binder FS. If you're paying attention to Android uh, usage in the kernel, uh, binder FS was a uh, backwards compatible. Uh, okay, so let me let me back up. So BinderFS is a new file system that su supports the same uh, features that Android's Binder IPC mechanism did. So Android, when it was first created, uh, they looked at the Linux kernel and decided that it did not have uh, an interprocess communication mechanism that suited their needs, and so they wrote their own. Actually, it's a little bit more complicated than that. They uh, they borrowed one from BIOS that, that some of the Android developers had worked on. Anyway, so they had this thing called Binder to do uh, process communication, but communication between Android applications and system components. But it's been a big mess of code, and it's really not, it was never really written in the Linux way. And so they finally uh, have introduced something that uh, does the same features, supports the same features, uh, but in uh, kind of the more Unix and uh, Linux way of doing things. And so they converted it into a file system, which is kind of the, how, how you do things properly in, in the Unix model. Uh, anyway, so Android is actually in the process of converting over uh, from Binder to Binder FS. Uh, so this is yet another step where uh, Android is uh, the features that Android needs are being fully integrated into the Linux kernel. And then uh, another thing in Linux 5.0 was the Eddy Anthem crypto module, which I think I'll talk about a little bit, a little bit more later, so I'm going to skip that here. A uh, couple other random things. Uh, so uh, in 5.0, we introduced JSON schemas for device tree bindings, and Frank could talk about that if he, if he wanted to. Um, and then uh, a dynamic events interface for, tra for the tracing subsystem. So the ability to add uh, new events uh, to be traced uh, in the tracing subsystem and to add and remove things. It's always been possible to add and remove um, trace points, uh, but uh, not. The, this is a little bit different mechanism that's easier to use. Uh, you used to have to use do something called K probes, where you wrote, wrote the new trace point from a loadable module. Uh, this allows you to do it from using uh, the user interface uh, or from using the debug FS interface to F trace. Um, so uh, you can now instrument the kernel however you like in a very dynamic fashion, which is very handy. Okay, got to be watching my time here a little bit, but. Um, Okay, in 5.1, uh, we had a lot of more interesting uh, stuff. We finally deprecated 8.0 support. A lot of people complained about dropping 8.0 support. Uh, this is the old pre-ELF uh, uh, binary format, and Linux can now no longer run those. Um, there were lots of uh, changes to the direct rendering manager um, and more year 2038 work. It seems uh, in, in this particular release 5.1, uh, this came out I think in March, uh, there was, uh, so there had been a bunch of uh, new 64-bit time values and the, the syscall code had been written but it hadn't been wired up into the actual syscall tables and they hadn't received their official numbers, uh, but now that's all been accomplished. So there is a list of 20 new syscalls and Man, we seem to have a lot of syscalls entering into the kernel these days. Uh, but there's a, a bunch of new syscalls with 64-bit time values uh, so to make them uh, so they will not suffer a problem with 32-bit rollover in, in the year 2038. A uh, couple other things uh, in terms of uh, power, and there's a new, so the kernel has energy-aware scheduling. But people have not been uh, enabling it by default, or if they do enable it, some people want to disable it. So there's a new syscontrol knob to be able to enable or disable it, and you can actually do it on the fly. There's some documents, if you're working in this area, you really want to go look at the, these documents, sketch energy and energy model. 
uh, to see how to use these new knobs and how to uh, actually do energy aware scheduling properly. Uh, one thing that also um, has been added is uh, in terms of power reduction of power in is uh, improved idle behavior for tickless systems. So some systems uh, run what is known as tickless. A, a lot of desktop systems who don't care about wasting power um, have a tick, a periodic tick that's going like maybe a hundred or a thousand times a second. Um, and, but there's been a lot of work over the years to remove that. And so um, uh, some systems try to get rid of that periodic uh, timer and uh, are do not have one and they live completely off of uh, scheduled interrupts instead of periodic interrupts. Anyway, it was determined uh, by Rafael Waisaki, who's been doing this stuff a long time, that the current CPU frequency governors, which were, which were, uh, uh, did not work that well uh, at, for tickless systems. Uh, and uh, so what he does is he uses uh, timer interrupt timing instead of device interrupt timing for predicting the next wake up. And that's a, that does not do any kind of justice to how complicated this problem is or what he's actually accomplished here. But he basically went in and analyzed uh, how the gov frequency governor worked and, um, and came up with a new frequency governor called TEO or Timer Events Oriented CPU Frequency Governor. Uh, which uses a, a different set of heuristics uh, to predict the next wake up. So when you're, when you're uh, trying to save power, it turns out to be really, really important to figure out when the next wake up is going to occur and try to go into as deep an idle state as possible. Uh, and so this is new behavior and people have already reported that it's, uh, that it's improved their power utilization on their system. So uh, things continue to get better for power management. A um, couple other new things in 5.1, uh, again, something for Android. Android had kind of another thing. Um, so Binder was an inter-process communication mechanism. Uh, Android also had this thing called AshMem, which was uh, another IPC mechanism. It was a shared memory uh, uh, system. And, but it's, Again, it was something that was bolted on. It was created by the uh, Google engineers kind of independently. And it was never really done in the proper Linux way. So Android has been trying to convert over to use something called MemFD. MemFD uh, is a shared memory uh, interprocess communication mechanism. And it was written pretty much uh, to address the needs of Android as well as address the needs of other systems uh, that need to use this type of IPC. But it was missing one operation that they needed, and they just finally added it. Um, it's called Seal Future Write, and basically allows a caller to uh, lock or seal a region of memory uh, and write to it themselves, but prevent other other users from writing to it. And you'd have to get into kind of the details of uh, how this memory is used in the system and and with the relationship between the callers. Uh, but this is actually kind of a big deal because it now means that uh, Android can uh, fully convert over to MemFD for all of its use cases. Uh, so we, another piece of Android legacy code that, uh, or the special special purpose legacy code that is going to be eliminated from the kernel. Uh, Ashmem should be going away. Uh, and then F2FS has a new mode bit that disables copy and write behavior for a file. Um, so F2FS is the flash friendly file system uh, written by Samsung and maintained by them, but it, it keeps getting uh, a lots of uh, interesting features. I don't know why they needed this, but it was, uh, but it was something that caught my eye uh, as an additional feature to F2FS. Okay, now Linux 5.2, we just had the merge window. Well, about was it a week ago, two weeks ago. Um, and there's a couple of interesting things here. So. EXT4 is adding support for case insensitive lookups. And this turns out to be a really tough problem uh, because you have to support it. Um, well, it, it turns out you have to actually pay attention to the semantics of the character system that you're using. In particular, in UTF-8, there's a whole lot of complexity involved with string handling. 
Uh, if you want to do uh, case insensitive compares, uh, you have to know the encoding and what characters actual mean. And so a whole bunch of uh, new string support has been added to the kernel that wasn't there before uh, just to support this. But uh, the obvious reason for this is that there are other file systems in the world that, that support case insensitive lookups and comparisons. And uh, so EXP4, uh, in order to be compatible with some of those, uh, needed this. There's a bunch of new system calls for file system mounting. Uh, there's support for ARM Molly GPUs. Uh, support for the field bus protocol, which I'll talk about more later. Uh, some of the speculative execution features, you can now control from the kernel command line uh, with a new option called mitigations equals, and you can control, you can specify which of the uh, mitigation features in the kernel you want to enable or disable. Um, and then uh, improved support for GCC W implicit fall through. I'm going to talk about, since these are all new features, I have like a page for each of these to talk about in detail. And then lots of VPF improvements. So I'm going to skim over that and talk about pressure stall monitors. Uh, so uh, one of the things that is important in embedded is uh, that you respond appropriately when your system comes under memory pressure, which means when you run out of memory. Um, and this is a big deal for Android, when they want to keep things, uh, they don't want the, um, the system to get sluggish when too much memory is being used. But this, can, this applies to any uh, system in Embedded where you have a limited number of, uh, limited amount of memory. And you need to be careful uh, how you respond to it. So there recently, was, and I think it was in the 4.19 kernel, uh, there was some pressure stall um, indicators. There was some new code put in there to, to uh, detect uh, the, that we were under memory pressure. So detect out of memory conditions. Uh, but uh, the new feature here is that there's some proc file system entries, uh, proc pressure memory, uh, that a user space program can actually write to to control how, uh, what frequency stalls are checked for and what the out, out, what algorithm is used for uh, how stalls are determined. Uh, and so uh, the idea is that you have a user space monitor uh, that can set the policy for how to, how to detect stalls and then respond appropriately. So the monitor writes some this, a stall notification specification into proc pressure memory, and then uses poll uh, to receive no, stall notification events that are based on that specification. Uh, the basic idea was that the old system, you could only respond, respond to memory pressure uh, uh, after about 10 seconds. Uh, this new system allows you to customize that, and you can re be responding to memory pressure in as little as a half a second. So this is, uh, this is a big improvement. Uh, and of course, the user space program can determine what kind of trade-offs they have to want to make in terms of, in terms of the overhead of detecting stalls uh, versus the, uh, the speed of responding to them. Uh, this has already been proven to be useful. Uh, people have done some tests on Android systems. And it allows you to uh, detect mounting memory pressure and, and kill processes before the device becomes sluggish. So. Um, if you're interested in low memory situations, uh, this is something you probably want to look at. Okay. Uh, this is, okay, so that's 5.2, and 5.2 is not even out yet. So, it, like I said, this is the last one. We're in the release candidate cycle for it, and it should be coming out in a couple months. If you look at the, the last uh, set of kernels, um, it's got a lot of differences uh, in terms of the number. Actually, it's interesting that the number of change sets seems to be going down uh, by just a little bit. We're almost uh, what, 1,600 change sets less uh, this release uh, than we have in previous releases coming, coming off of like 4.20 or uh, some early releases. Uh, but if you look at lines of code, there's a lot of lines of codes changed, still hovering around 600,000 lines of code added to the kernel, and in this case, about 400,000 lines of code removed. Um, so in terms of the number of developers, it's actually been also been kind of going down slowly. 
Uh, that last number there, 1584, take that, um, that, that is probably not the correct number. Uh, the other numbers I got from LWN.net, and they have their own script which determines the number of developers. I used my own script, so that 1584 probably is not counting people the same way, but I got a much smaller number of developers on this release. So that, that could be interesting, but it's a questionable number. Um, but the community seems to be humming along. Uh, it's a little bit worrying if there are if we are seeing a reduction in developers, but uh, uh, maybe it means we're being more efficient. I don't know. Uh, in terms of technology areas, I'm just going to go through a couple of areas that I think are interesting. So, uh, in terms of audio, uh, there's something that was added to the 5.2 kernel. I didn't have, didn't have it on my list earlier, uh, but there's something called Sound Open Firmware. So, one of the projects that uh, one of the things that was identified by Intel, and they, they talked about this at uh, the last year's Embedded Linux conference, um, was that uh, there's an awful lot of IP blocks having to deal with audio uh, on, a, on a semiconductor, and the firmware for that is all closed source firmware, uh, which means, so like if you have a DSP that's managing uh, audio decoding, uh, the code that drives that DSP is closed source. And uh, Intel and, other, and others, Google, got together and they said, well, why should that be the case? We, we would really like to use the advantages of open source for developing that firmware. So this is not code that runs in the kernel, per se, but this is code that runs actually on the semiconductor chip on these specialized IP blocks, uh, things like DSPs and codec chips and stuff. Uh, anyway, support for open firmware. Uh, this project has been under development for like about two years, but it was finally mainlined in 5.2, uh, at least in the latest merge window. And so this is something I think that's really good. If you're doing audio uh, on your on your semiconductor, uh, there's now an option to go with open source code for for that hardware, um, as opposed to just closed source. Uh, so this is the actual code that runs on the DSP. Uh, and not on like the CPU where Linux is running. So that's, that's really interesting, I think. In terms of open, uh, another area of open source is uh, we finally got support for open source Molly drivers. So Molly is the name of the uh, chip or IP block or GPU. This is the GPU uh, that is provided by ARM for a lot of their chips. Um, and so uh, we finally got open source drivers for uh, this GPU, or as it's a series of GPUs. So there's two different open source projects, uh, Lima for older GPUs, and there's a new project called Panfrost, uh, which uh, is for recent GPUs. But again, this is an area where G GPU drivers, this is essentially it's the same thing as the audio. There's the, the firmware, the code that runs on the uh, on the driver hardware, on the GPU, is it has historically been closed source, and we're starting to see a big shift in that. So we now have open source drivers uh, for uh, this important GPU family. Um, so that's really good. Uh, another thing is that Android is finally using uh, DRM KMS, and uh, I think I talked about that before, so I'm going to skip over it. Uh, but again, it's better support for Android. Uh, Okay, so I thought I said I'd talk about this uh, this weird uh, dash w implicit fall through. So, uh, and this is kind of the kernel coding section. So, if you are if you are writing code in the kernel, uh, one of the, one of the mistakes that you might make is uh, you might forget to put the break in your in your case block, and have and the, one of the uh, people have said that it's a design deficiency in the C language that. Uh, it automatically falls through between from one case statement to another in a switch statement. Uh, but in any event, the GCC people have now added a warning that will tell you if it sees a missing break, if, if you're getting, uh, if you're seeing a fall through. And so uh, now that that warning is available, people in the kernel have said, well, we ought to use that to make the kernel uh, better. Uh, so you can use this switch to make switch statements more robust, and you can see that there's a link there to give you information on the feature. 
But here's the, here's the thing. There are cases where people have specifically said, I want to fall through. That's not a mistake. I, you know, I have two cases in my switch statement, and, and, uh, the, and the fall through is intentional. And so there's actually a way that you can mark that with a comment. Uh, so GCC will read the comment, uh, realize that, and, and use that to ignore the warning. Uh, so there's been an extensive analysis of the kernel. There were 2,311 cases where there were uh, switch statements that were a, a case statement fell through to the next one. And all, all of them except for 32 have now been analyzed. This is all done in the 5.2 release. Um, once that is complete, all that as, analysis is complete, and, all, and there were comments in some places. Those comments have been converted over to the correct syntax that GCC will recognize. Once that complete, they can turn on that warning by default, and all newly submitted code uh, will have these fall-through errors caught automatically. So uh, this is uh, this is a case where the kernel had to be modified in order to take advantage of a uh, new feature of GCC, uh, but it should make the code much more robust. So that's uh, implicit fall-through, uh, dash w implicit fall-through. Okay, another thing in, in kernel coding that I wanted to talk about was BPF. So BPF continues to mature. Um, it, it, it BPF stands for Berkeley Packet Filter. It's the way that you run uh, virtual machine code inside the kernel. So you can actually compile a program uh, outside the kernel uh, and run it in a contained environment. So there's a, when BPF code is loaded, there's a verifier that makes sure that it cannot do bad things. This is not like a kernel loadable module that's just native C code. This is a, this is a restricted execution environment, so uh, theoretically even end users that are not root could potentially add things. So the verifier has some very, very stringent, very strict constraints. One of the things is there's no support for loops, um, which uh, can, can obviously could create an unbounded uh, situation. But we continue to see improvements. So uh, the BPF improvements in 5.2, uh, we had uh, several things. There's much pro faster program verifier. Uh, for some large uh, code bases, it's up to 20 times faster. Uh, there's an expanded size limit for the instruction set for BPF. So BPF is a virtual machine. And before, you could only load a program that was four, had 4K of instructions, and now that's been uh, increase to one bag of instructions. So you can really load a quite complicated uh, program. Uh, BPF programs can access global data, they can change, they can control changes to syscontrol knobs. So I think, I believe they can introduce new knobs and they can uh, add, adjust how knobs function. So uh, really BPF is taking over as, uh, as kind of a, the preferred mechanism for doing a lot of user space uh, manipulation of kernel policy. Um, so that's if if that's the type of thing you're interested in, you should go look at that. Okay. In terms of languages, um, <clears throat> I only have two languages that I really talk about: uh, Python and C++. Uh, Python has become dominant language in machine learning and AI. Uh, there's a bunch of different reasons for that, but uh, even to, even. Even in statistical analysis, uh, I saw a, a study that, or a, a survey that showed that the R statistical language is now kind of dropped off the top 20 list. Um, and it continues to grow in popularity, uh, which is good if you're a Python developer, because uh, the more popular languages, the easier it is to get a job, the more tools and libraries and ecosystem that gets developed around it. In terms of languages, for C and C++, uh, uh, GCC 9.1 just was released a couple of um, uh, weeks ago, uh, maybe two weeks ago. Uh, very, very sad when I looked up the status of this, they have removed support for the Cell Broadband Engine SBU. Uh, if you don't know what that is, that is, uh, those are the SBUs that are part of uh, the Sony Station 3 processor, uh, Cell Broadband Engine. So uh, I realize the Sony PlayStation 3 processor is old and, and it's not really supported anymore, uh, but it's still sad to see it go. I actually worked on this for a little while. Not a little while. Not the view coding. 
uh, quite a long time ago, so it's kind of sad to see it get removed from GCC. A uh, couple of other things that are, and this is this is a very short list. You can see the URL there if you want to see uh, all of the changes in the nine uh, GCC nine release. Uh, the live patching flag does some optimizations for code uh, that allows it to be used, allows you to generate code that can be then applied as a live patch against other code. And uh, obviously, there's some restrictions on the type of operations you can do and, the, and concurrency and optimizations. Um, and then lots of diagnostics improvements. So GCC is really uh, getting very good about uh, showing diagnostic information. I think primarily because LLVM was showing them up. Uh, but you can now get, uh, it shows line numbers uh, in the diagnostics source. It, anytime it emits source code as part of diagnostics information, uh, it'll show you, you can turn on a flag to show line numbers. You can show source code region labels. Uh, and you can even, output the diagnostics information. So when you get, and by diagnostics information, I mean when you get an error report from the compiler or a warning, it'll actually show you the code and it'll highlight the code. Uh, you can colorize it, it'll actually indent and show you a little carrot to show you what, where on the line the, the problem is. Uh, but the, interestingly, you can also di output the diagnostics information in JSON format, so it can be machine readable. So they've tried to make it, make improvements they're outputting a lot more information, it's more human readable, and it's more machine readable. Uh, so you could actually do things like uh, have something read the compiler output and go and fix the code automatically. Um, there's also been a lot of other optimization improvements. So there are uh, new opt options for profile-driven dri optimizations. Profile-driven optimization is when you record how a run works. Uh, you save the profile information, you feed that into the next time you compile the the code. And then link time optimization. Link time optimization is when you compile everything into one big binary uh, and uh, that allows you, when you when the compiler has the scope to see the entire binary, you can do a lot more aggressive optimizations. Anyway, one of the big problems with LTO has been that um, it was slow to compile because for something like the Linux kernel, Trying to keep all of the simple information in, in memory at once was difficult, but they've done uh, they've done a lot of optimizations there to make it better. Okay, so moving along, uh, LLVM 8.0 was released. That was a while ago. Uh, a lot of the improvements in that release had to do with the uh, security, Spectre, and Meltdown uh, features. Okay. Networking, so uh, Wi-Fi 6, 802.11.ax support was added to the kernel in 4.19, and field bus support was added in 5.2. So field bus is industrial network for real-time distributed control. Uh, this is used in a lot of industrial automation. Uh, it's a fairly old uh, protocol, but it, there's lots of different flavors of it, and so but it's nice that it's been added. So Linux is increasingly being used in uh, industrial in the industrial field. In terms of security, uh, we have the Adiantum lightweight crypto algorithm was added in 5.0, and I talked about this one already, uh, but basically this is um, storage encryption for low-end hardware, uh, which means a cell phone, really what this is designed for is a budget cell phone so that, so that people running like a $50 phone uh, can still have their stuff encrypted. Uh, when they're running on a processor that does not have, uh, so it's a pure software uh, crypto algorithm. Uh, and uh, there's a white paper if you want to go read it. It's kind of heavy on the math, but uh, if you want to see how it works. Uh, and it re replaced a very controversial algorithm in the kernel called the spec algorithm. Um, and I'm going to move along here, I think. Okay, so now getting to testing. Uh, there's a couple of things that are new here and a couple of things that are old. So k self test has been around a long time. This is the subsystem uh, inside the kernel for doing self-testing. Um, and some of the recent uh, work is just more texts and a lot of fixes to tests. And you can kind of see the status of that. It's kind of chugging along. There'll be some more, some more work on this uh, coming out this fall uh, that I think people will be interested in. Uh, Fuego. Uh, we had our 1.4 release in, in January of 2019. This is a test framework uh, for uh, testing Linux that I'm involved with. Uh, we have our 1.5 release in development. I think the, the highlight here 
Uh, the new thing here is integration with other test systems. So uh, we have one developer who's very active with Fuego who's been uh, working very hard to integrate it with other systems. And Fuego now has the capability, at least in our next branch, this is in development, uh, you can run, you can take Monaro tests and run them in Fuego, or you can take Fuego tests and run those in Lava. Uh, so you can so you can mix and match uh, test frameworks. So this is all just demonstrated at a uh, set of sessions at Lenaro Connect. Uh, so that's actually very exciting. There's a number of Fuego users who are using Lava, and uh, there's a lot. This interoperability is uh, turning out to be uh, very useful. Uh, kernel CI uh, is another testing system that uh, does continuous integration of uh, the kernel on a lot of different boards, particularly ARM boards, embedded boards. Uh, and they've been branching out for a long time. Kernel CI was just doing build and boot tests, and now they're starting to actually do uh, some specific subsystem tests. And we'll see a lot more of those, uh, I think, going on in the future. But they're still working on becoming a Linux Foundation project. Um, they had, had, have, there's a certain critical mass. You have to have about five founding members. And right now, they've got four people who are lined up. So if you're interested in supporting kernel testing, uh, you should uh, I, send me an email. Or you can contact Kevin Hillman, who's driving this, this uh, effort. And uh, we can hook you up. So this allows you to get involved with, uh, with kernel testing, which is really important for the, for the community. And then the, the other thing that's seen a lot of traffic lately on the mail list is the K-Unit test framework. Uh, so there's a set of patches for kernel unit testing. Um, and it's, I, I'm not going to go into all the details here. There's, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, whether the, this should go into the kernel. There were some, there's some existing systems that have overlap with it. Um, but it's getting a lot of uh, discussion right now. Uh, OK, uh, we're getting there. So uh, in terms of conferences, uh, we have the past conferences. Uh, we had ELC Europe in, uh, last fall and the Automated Testing Summit. Uh, one that I went to recently was Lenaro Connect. That was in Bangkok, Thailand. And we have a bunch of good testing meetings there. So as I said, we did a lot of demonstrations of Fuego uh, interacting with Lava and LKFD. Um, we talked to the squad people there, which is a, a, a test results visualization system. So there's a lot of good meetings going on there. Uh, I gave a keynote on open source quality assurance. Uh, if you're interested, you can look at, look at my keynote. It's embedded uh, inside a, a kind of a long video. but. Um, Anyway, so a lot of stuff going on. Here's what's coming up, a lot of stuff coming up. This is going to be a busy uh, fall uh, because Embedded Linux Conference, which usually is in March, is now in August, this year only. But we have uh, Open Source Summit Japan, an Automotive Linux Summit, coming up in July in Tokyo. And I'll actually be attending that, so hopefully I'll see some of you people there. Uh, we've got Embedded Linux Conference, uh, like I said, is coming up in San Diego in August. And then September, we have Linux Plumbers uh, in Portugal, at ELC Europe, and France. And we'll be doing uh, the Automated Testing Summit this time as an official conference. So we are just working on things like the logo and the call for papers and sponsorship. Uh, this is, you are the first people outside of me and the Linux Foundation event staff to see the logo for the Automated Testing Summit. Uh, so this is a new technical conference for companies, developers doing automated testing of open source products and uh, to share knowledge, techniques, and standards for open source quality assurance. And so this is going to be a full-fledged uh, Linux Foundation conference that is open to the public. And so if you are interested in becoming a sponsor, let me know. Um, uh, so. We, uh, this, this year, it's going to be uh, two tracks, uh, one day event. So it's still a fairly small conference. We're just getting it off the ground. Uh, but we'll see how it goes. Um, industry news. So or, uh, just a couple of things that I thought were interesting. Uh, I think for the Linux Foundation, there's trade associations. Uh, Linux Foundation always has a whole bunch of projects going on. 
Um, the one I thought was really interesting was this ELISA, which is a safety critical project. Uh, so this is, they started in February. I haven't seen any news from them yet. I think they're still, still kind of getting up to speed, but I think it's really, people have been talking about safety critical Linux for a long, long time. And it's nice to see a project that's actually uh, starting to work on this in a formal way. Uh, it's kind of piggybacking on the previous work by an organization in uh, Europe called OSADL. Uh, the Civil Infrastructure Platform has announced a new long-term support kernel. Uh, and they based that on the 4.19 kernel. So uh, not long, I got to be careful here, not just long-term, it's a super long-term support. So I think this one is, uh, they're going to work on for six years, if I'm not mistaken. And they also created a new security work group. Uh, LF Edge, uh, LF, Linux Foundation is getting into IoT and other things, and they've got a, a project that kind of organizes, uh, it's an umbrella organization to take in a bunch of uh, edge computing projects, uh, which we're seeing a lot of with the rise of IoT. And then uh, AGL released a new version in March, um, and I already, uh, I think, pointed out that Hyundai had joined AGL. The most recent one, this was announced in April, was Volkswagen has joined AGL. So they're continuing to get uh, additional members. Um, and this, this one I thought was the most, was, was really interesting. If you have a long history with Linux, you know that Microsoft was not always um, a big fan of Linux. Uh, but Microsoft continues to embed and support Linux. So uh, Microsoft has announced uh, something called Windows Subsystem for Linux, a WSL2 is the second version of that. And Microsoft will actually be shipping with Windows 10 a version of the Linux kernel. Uh, so Microsoft is now shipping with their desktop OS. So for a long time, Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud service, has supported Linux Guest. You kind of have to because the, a lot of uh, back-end processing in the cloud happens on Linux. So. But Azure continues to support Linux, and the Azure cloud developers uh, are actually active in the Linux kernel community. But when I saw that Microsoft was going to ship Linux, Linux kernel with Windows, uh, that kind of blew my mind. So uh, Microsoft really has come around. So the other thing I want to talk about in terms of uh, industry adoption, or Linux, oh, is Linux adoption. So. Uh, this is nothing to do with embedded, but I thought it was interesting. The government of South Korea has announced that they are switching from Windows to Linux uh, for all government computers. It's like a huge project. Uh, this was prompted by the Windows 7 end of life by Microsoft. Uh, the reason for they're doing this is to reduce long-term costs, and they really don't want their government computers sending information back to Microsoft, so, which is kind of baked into Windows 10. Uh, so you can see... Uh, so Windows, uh, the, the, the question is, uh, so Windows, Linux is actually making inroads, in, continuing to make inroads. So there's been some discussion recently in, in the news, is this the year of Linux desktop? Well, a couple of things say yes, and at least one person says no. Uh, so Chrome, it was announced that, uh, Google has announced that Chrome is getting native Linux app support. So every Chrome computer, which is, you know, a, uh, it was, it was a Linux-based desktop, but it was specifically kind of a web, had web-based applications. Well, now you'll be able to run Linux applications. So essentially, a Chromebook is a Linux laptop. Um, and then Windows 10 is shipping with Linux kernel, so that's, that's weird. Uh, the person who says no, though, is Mark Shuttleworth. Who's, uh, Mark Shuttleworth is the, uh, is the CEO, founder of Canonical, who makes Ubuntu. And they just have had a terrible time uh, making any inroads, uh, getting uh, getting market share for Ubuntu. So he says uh, Linux has failed in the desktop market. Uh, but you have to go read the article. So some people say, yes, this is the year of Linux desktop. And at least one major person says no. Uh, but I just thought that was interesting. Um, so where, uh, Thank you for your attention. I just want to show you where I get a lot of my information from. If you want to follow Linux news, uh, the best place to do so is lwn.net. Uh, and some of the content that I have uh, in my presentation, I have links throughout the presentation. You probably saw a lot of lwn.net uh, URLs. 
Uh, some of the content is delayed by, for two weeks, so if it's like super recent stuff that occurred in April, or, or in May, rather, uh, you might have to wait a little while, or you could get a subscription. Uh, subscription lets you see the, the information immediately. Uh, but other places where you can get good uh, articles uh, and content about uh, Linux is Linux.com, Linux Gizmos, Linux Journal, and Pharonix. Uh And uh, we keep a lot of information out on the eLinux Wiki. And of course, Google, if you want to look up a particular topic that I have here, usually you'll have the right words you can type into Google to find, uh, to find the material on it. So uh, with that, I thank you for your time. And uh, are there any questions on any of the material that I've covered today? OK, thank you, Dean. Uh, uh, maybe I'm so much uh, uh, you know, interested in about uh, you know, Microsoft behavior. And uh, I just think that in uh, the near future, the kernel of the Windows will tend to the Linux kernel. <laughs> no way. <laughs> anyway, uh, one, uh, one thing I'd like to address is that the uh, closing date of the session proposal for uh, end the Linux conference will be uh, set to the, the July 1st. So some, oh, yeah. uh, some of the Japanese people uh, who are trying to make a session proposal will have some difficulty in writing English. And maybe, Tim and Frank, you will be able to make some of the assistance uh, when somebody asks you to make a review of English or some of the, uh, uh, such kind, uh, make a suggestion or comment. Is it possible for you to accept such kind of you know, uh, requests from the uh, Japanese people to, to make a review of the session proposal? Yes. Uh, as, so as members of the program committee, we often see proposals that we wish uh, people had talked to us about before they submitted them. Because uh, a lot of times we can help people uh, identify things that, that would be more interesting. I mean, it's not just, it's not just the English. It's also just the content. You know, people have, when they submit, uh, they think, oh, this is going to be interesting. And, uh, and we can tell that they have something interesting to say, but it's really just a slight, if we can kind of help them say something slightly different, uh, we, it's more appealing to the program committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've said, uh, yeah, I'm quite happy to help someone. If you want to send me an email with a draft of your, of your proposal, um, I'm willing to take a look at it and give you some tips. That, that's not, I can't guarantee that that will mean your talk gets accepted, uh, but I think we can, I can help you increase the odds. Oops. So, okay. uh, sorry, I lost my audio there for a second. Okay. Uh, so, yes, so uh, if, you have, if you want to propose something for ELC Europe, uh, you're, feel free to send me or Frank an email. Well, I spoke for Frank. I don't know if he wants to. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. Um, any questions or some of the discussions here? Okay. Uh, hi, this is uh, Puneet. Yeah, I just wanted to make a remark. The TEO, uh, you have it marked as a frequency governor. It's actually an idle governor in the power management updates for the kernel. I just wanted to kind of have that clarified. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't think, I didn't hear that very well. Could you say that again? I'm oh, sorry, right. So uh, in, in one of your slides, you have uh, the, the idle time, the tickless idle uh, stuff like in a power management update, I think it's slide 19 or 20. You, you had it marked right. as, a, as a CPU free governor, it's actually a CPU idle governor. Just wanted to. Oh, okay. Thank you. Right. Sorry. Yeah, that's a good correction. I need to go back and uh, I'll try to update that on, on the in the PDF and get it uploaded. I, on that particular slide, I felt bad because I basically, I mean, there's a whole LWN.net article that talks about that, um, and you should definitely read the article. It's got. I had to kind of condense what the difference was down to one sentence, one bullet, and it, I did not do it justice at all. It's OK for you? OK, thanks, Tim. Um, any other questions or discussions? OK. Anyway, 
Thank you very much, team, and uh, we direct to close this session. Uh, have a good evening today. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.